wonderful crowd. Thank you for uh, your interest in the story, and certainly Ms. Porter Sally, and uh, her desire to help me bring the story to you. Um, as Professor Miller mentioned, I'm a playwright, a novelist, and a composer. I'm a little bit of everything in, in the theater department. I've been a theater artist since the sixth grade when I asked my principal if we could put on a play in the North Coast. And um, the Battle of Emmett Till, uh, I think, is uh, my most, uh, certainly my most popular work and most successful work to date. Um, it's that since its premiere in Chicago in 2008, has had a show every year. And in fact, this season is going to be uh, enjoying four different performances in Milwaukee, and Georgia, and in San Diego, and in Pittsburgh. So uh, certainly as the Black Lives Matter movement has grown interest in Emmett's story as an ar our archival uh, and archetypical story has grown. And uh, so uh, I'm really, Delighted and honored to have had the, the opportunity to um, bring this saga to life from a different vantage point. So I wanted to share with you today, you know, uh, kind of improvisationally. I drove down to Massachusetts, so we're going to kind of keep that road runner energy going. Um, and uh, share with you some of my process and uh, some of the motivation in creating the piece. And uh, then open it to conversation with um, I was a child of the Civil Rights Movement, and uh, I first uh, encountered, um, I was integrated when I was uh, nine years old, but I didn't encounter Emma Till's story until I was uh, uh, a teenager. And uh, I understand some, a bunch of you, you know, saw the documentary, how many of you saw the documentary yesterday about, ah, okay, some, so, so for those of you who maybe didn't uh, see that saga or see that documentary, in brief, um, I can just skip to the next slide. Ah, okay. Um, the story is about a 14-year-old youth from Chicago who journeys uh, to Mississippi uh, in August of 1955. And um, his journey um, certainly changes his changes at the course of the nation as well. And so I wanted to uh, kind of look at this story uh, from the vantage point of view. As a child of the Civil Rights Movement, I was very interested in uh, Emmett Till the youth and what agency youth played in that saga and what agency youth, as also uh, an indicator of the agency that youth has always played in um, the creation of meaningful social social change. And you all are on the vistas of uh, uh, confronting immense uh, issues of inequity and issues of democracy and issues of fairness and equality and opportunity. And so uh, it's my supposition that, that uh, the energy that Emmett Till represents is the energy that you all also possess. Uh, to be manifest in whatever passion moves you. So, um, uh, in kind of looking at this story, um, I didn't quite know how I was going to proceed with the process. So, you know, first thing, you know, I said, well, okay, if I'm going to do the story I'm going to tell, you know, first got to do some research. Because I know basically a couple uh, of experiential uh, but, uh, so where do you go? This is pre-Wikipedia. You know, where do you go when you want to start your research? Anybody? Library. library. Okay, so I took myself to the library. And I said, well, uh, and this is one uh, very interesting thing about uh, the Till Saga. It was a highly, highly documented case. It was like a national soap opera of race. that was played out in the newspapers in the North and the South. The black press and the white press, so there was a tremendous amount of information uh, that was available. And this is what was interesting for the theme of skeptics, because you would think, because there's so much information, 
that uh, the story is readily available. What I found was that as I, even as I looked at this archival information, this primary research, there were a lot of holes in it that didn't quite seem to make sense to me. So I, I, that, that was my first lesson, which I will share with, share with you, that even if it's in print, even if it's documented, even if it's supposed to be from an expert, you must approach that information with skepticism, because the only truth that you have is that it's printed and that it's representing itself as truth. But that's not necessarily the case. You've always got to kind of scratch the needs. And look behind the lines and also uh, look more deeply. This was also a case, as I said, was a national soap opera uh, that was played out in imaging. Imaging of Emmett, imaging, which began with the, the, the image of his uh, face, his mutilated face after this beating uh, in an open casket. His mother's insistence on having an open casket. And that photograph being then distributed first in the black press of the Defender and Jet Magazine and subsequently throughout the national press was, was uh, is what broke this story open and pulled the veil of white supremacy, the terrorism of white supremacy. It pulled the veil off of that with this face. But there were also images of Emmett in his his life and of the killers and of all of the major players within this trial. So first, when I started to look at this imaging, I started with the image of the youth himself. Uh, and uh, kind of looking at Emmett's picture on the uh, left-hand side, what do you see in that picture? Anybody? He's happy. He's happy, yeah. How's he dressed? He's dressed very nicely, right? And uh, what's in what? Uh, what's the environment? What's he leaning on? A TV. A TV. In 1955. So what's that tell you? Ah, yeah. If he doesn't have money, there's aspiration there. Yeah. And uh, his family was one of the only families that had a color TV, as I found out. Uh, and if you look more deeply, even. What's inside the TV? The TV's on. Isn't that odd for a picture? He said, you know, whoever said that, you know, they, they wanted to have as much business in the work as they could. So what's inside uh, the television screen, if you can kind of vaguely make it out? CBS. CBS. The eye of CBS, Channel 2, right? And so, uh, and that was a major news network, and their symbol was an eye. So right within this picture, there's everything that this story is going to be about right within this picture. There's one other thing that was very interesting to me. Look at his eyes. What does his gaze tell me? Where's he looking? Straight at. He's looking straight at the camera. He's looking straight at life. He's ready for it. And, you know, for those of you, you know, there may be some others and maybe some What's the lean about? What does that say about it? Pardon? He's got a confidence to him. And he's got a posture that's, you know, trying out a little bit of manhood here. Right? So these are all characteristics that you can glean just from looking at that picture. That's a very, very different portrait from uh, the image that his mother was portraying which was a kind of a prepubescent, didn't know anything about girls kind of youth. And the portrait that the Southern press was painting of him, and that Caroline Bryant, the, uh, the clerk who alleged that he uh, accosted her, was painting. So here I saw something very different from both of those images. And that began my kind of quest to kind of put some, some, some muscle on what started to be just impressions. And then looking at his picture with his mom next door, uh, just very quickly, because I agree, what's the difference between her gaze and his? She's dreaming. She's, and she's not necessarily engaged. And that was another kind of one of my theses, that, that the aging of change, the aging of change as represented mostly as this story has been portrayed, is with 
made me tell nobly his mother. And her decision to open that casket and have the world see what was done to her child. But in fact, yeah, he is her child, so he was raised by her. But the person who was engaged with life, who was moving life forward in this moment before the tragedy is the son. And that energy, it is my thesis, was transferred to the mother who in her grief became a warrior mother and took on some of that mantle of engaging life and confronting life. So, uh, and you know, you can see how uh, as we went into production, how much the imaging then kind of reflected what the stage productions would look like. This was the Chicago premiere. Um, you know, one wonderful young actor, uh, I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on his name right now, uh, who played in embodying that, that carefree uh, uh, zest for life. And um, uh, then uh, this was, and there were some other things that were very interesting. The car was always the same. The car in every production looks exactly the same, no matter what the actors are. Uh, but um, on the left hand side, that is the Houston production, and on the right hand side is the Los Angeles production. Um, and I tried to kind of create out of this very documentary piece something that was very ethereal so that all of the action came out of the actors' bodies, as you can see. Um, and uh, the transformation of the character, the, the ghostliness of the story, um, this is evident in this transition in the Chicago production. And uh, then this is also Emmett as the ghostly figure in the Minneapolis production. So you can see very, very different interpretations of, of visual interpretations of that initial um, story. Um, so let me talk a little bit about um, kind of process. So how did I, once I started getting all this information, I was first Beginning with this death image, and I made it small. Those of you who want to look at it more carefully can find it online. But you know, I choose to remember Emmett in life and not in death. But this is the image that changed uh, the game in terms of uh, civil rights struggles in the United States. And I would venture to suggest that that was also the template for human rights struggles thenceforth into the global world, even up to uh, the Arab Spring, uh, the nonviolent protest, the spontaneous uh, outpour of people in a nonviolent fashion uh, protesting uh, the uh, injustice of their government uh, began with the American Civil Rights Struggle here. Um, uh, there's also imaging, as I said, of the killers and of the courtroom. This is a scene from the trial. And uh, what was interesting to me, again, is, is, as you were researchers going out into the world and looking for that, that uh, what's the story that's not being told? If you, uh, Caroline Bryant, who was sitting next to her husband, Roy Bryant, who was one of uh, Emmett's murderers. Uh, but what is most interesting to me is the relationship between these two people, as I could imagine it as a dramatist. Uh, the estrangement and the, the physical coldness that you kind of feel between them even now. I said, well, what's the root of that? That's going to you know, kind of give you some dramatic conversation. But also, if you look in the back at how they are being viewed, there's a gentleman on this side and a gentleman on the other side. Uh, can you make out their faces? What do their faces tell you about their attitude toward this case, toward that? They don't care? They were very angry at him. Somebody, the, the man right in the middle is very angry. But what's this guy doing over here? Doesn't he look like he's got his tongue out like, you know, this is some really sexy stuff, you know. There's a, there's a luridness, there's a, a, a fascination with the sexuality of this case. And the fascination with the sexual narrative of the black male and the white female in the South that is completely captivating that audience behind them. And it looked like it was burning 
their eyes burned him into her back <coughs> with their salacious thoughts. So all of that goes into your thinking of what this drama is about. And on top of that, the courtroom, it was 110 degrees outside, and this is pre-air conditioning, so you can imagine what the temperature was inside that courtroom. Um, and um, just very kind of speeding along, just looking at uh, visual imaging. Um, that's available, that was available to me just looking at the case. On the left hand side is a panoply of, of black people who were involved in the case. Uh, and you see in that range, again, a range of class, from very well dressed middle class people to a sharecropper. Yeah. So uh, you have Mrs. Mo Till Mobley in the center, and she's flanked by her father and uh, um, Dr. Howard, who was a Southern activist, and uh, one of our early black congressmen, Congressman Diggs, who uh, is in the straight tie. And by Congressman Diggs is Amanda Bradley, who was one of the witnesses who had the courage enough to come forward, who saw the truck in which Emmett uh, was being held, and um, who, not knowing anything about the case, not be involved with any of the people, had enough courage to come forward and give, give testimony. Uh, so yes. Many of the people here don't know what happened in the grocery store. Ah, so, uh, well, that's sure. still a mystery to this day. Emmett uh, came down on Sunday, and uh, he was supposed to be picking cotton, uh, helping his, his great uncle out. He lasted in the cotton fields one day, in fact, one half a day. Uh, and um, then on Wednesday of that week, all of the boys who had come down, all the cousins who had come down to help with um, the cotton picking, uh, went into town to get some coke and get some all done. And um, Emmett went into the store and uh, in uh, Muddy, Mississippi, an interesting name. And in the process of getting some bubble gum, uh, put uh, Carolyn Ryan put it out of her hand and he put the dime in her hand. And uh, then uh, as he came out of the store, and she came out of the store and walked in front of him, and he whistled at her. And that alarmed all of the black adults who were at the store. The cousins all ran to the car, and she ran to her car, and someone said she's going to get a gun, and they sped away. Uh, and Thursday forgot about it. Uh, you know, they were, you know, should we tell Uncle Moses? Because in the South, that was maybe a legal offense that he had copily would whistle. And, um, but by Thursday, Friday, they kind of forgot about it. Saturday, um, the relatives of the store clerk, Caroline Bryan, Saturday morning, uh, it was actually Sunday morning, 2 a.m. They picked him, they came to that, his, his uncle's house, abducted him, tortured him for six hours, and then threw his body in the river. Um, uh, weighted down with a gin pan, uh, presuming that the body would never be found. Um, his body rose up upside down, and uh, his feet were visible by a fisherman three days later. And um, the case unfolded from there. Um, so, uh, in the right hand side, this is a picture of the white press. And again, you can see from their visages how startling all this information was to northern reporters. They came down in droves to kind of see what this case was about. And for the first time, they had to confront the reality of the hatred, the reality of the torture, the reality of the murder. It's not like black men hadn't been murdered in the South before. You know, a couple of men had been murdered uh, trying to register voters a uh, month before, but they were older men and they were Southern. This was a Northern uh, youth, teenager, preteen, if you will. And that startled everyone. And uh, that, uh, kind of awakening, uh, kind of set the role of the mainstream press in covering civil rights from that sport. Uh, 
but you can see in their faces how completely bewildered and shocked they are at what they're hearing and seeing. So, um, really quickly, um, the other aspect I did was to do some interviews uh, and looking at some of the articles. Um, William Bradford Huey, who was a reporter for Look Magazine, uh, did an interview of the killers and they confessed after they were exonerated in trial, they confessed to the murder and it was published in Look Magazine. And um, this was again supposed to be like grounded in truth. But there were a couple things even in that article that didn't quite make sense to me. Uh, one, Huey said that uh, uh, Jacob, that the Amaya, one of the murderers, uh, uh, got really annoyed with Emmett because he boasted that he had a white girlfriend and he even showed him a picture of his white girlfriend in his wallet. And then Huey said, I went to Chicago and I talked to some of his friends and they pointed out the girl. Now I was living in Chicago at the time and it was then as it was in 1955, one of the most segregated cities in the country. And I'm like, a white girl in Chatham, Southside Chicago in 1955, how, how plausible is that? And in fact, it was not plausible. Now, if he had said, I went out to Argo where his grandmother lived, uh, which was in the country, and, uh, uh, which was in the suburbs, which was more, a more integrated community, I could see it. But I was skeptical of Huey saying that he had seen this girl and that he had talked to some of Emmett's friends who had pointed out this girl. So that led me to trying to find his classmates, to finding his high school, his uh, junior high school picture. In fact, his school, his school, there were no white students in that school. There were some light-skinned girls who maybe looked white, but you know. So there again, that skepticism was a healthy skepticism. But that led me to really doing some more interviews on my own winding up talking to Wheeler Parker on the top and Simeon Wright on the bottom, who were his cousins, two of his cousins, uh, still living, who were with him that last week of his life. And um, who gave me, you know, very intimate detail of who this kid was. And then looking on the other side of that, I went to talk with anyone in Mississippi uh, who could give me more information, such as Mayor Thomas, uh, Johnny Thomas, who was on the left-hand side, who was the son of H.L. Loggins, who was one of the black men accused of uh, being an accomplice. If he didn't uh, restrain Emmett, he at very least um, helped to clean out the truck and um, destroy some of his clothing and shoes. And Mayor Thomas was part of his wanting to give bear witness was to, in some public way, atone for even the suspicion that his father was involved in this crime. So there's also something called a geographic narrative. My mother named it the wanderer, so you know, most of my work has to deal with uh, characters moving through time and space. And you know, as you as you look at, you know, you're going out into the world. What does the place tell you? This is in Chicago. So Chicago, all the Chicago imaging was very vertical. Again, that dispiring, that, that desire to move up. Uh, that's Emmett's home, and that's the gym of his school. Um, even today, you know, the neighborhood has deteriorated some. You can still see that it is upwardly mobile um, and aspiring. And then you uh, look at uh, the archival images of the Mississippi uh, uh, store, this is the actual store in money at the time, Bryant's uh, meat and grocery store. But you're also then, in your geographic travels, able to see how things move, what happens to things through time, from the then and there to the here and now, and what the journey of the buildings tells you as you're kind of uh, thinking about the story. And what was interesting for me in this one was, if you look closely at the, at the detailed portrait, um, this was in, shortly after Katrina, I went down to see the store. And I could see in the lattices that were revealed uh, the outline of Emmett's name, the T-I-L-L -L in capital letters. And again, that ghostliness that was haunting me uh, 
was made manifest in the imaging that I saw. I went to the shed where he was killed, the bridge where um, they um, dumped his body, which again was a different place. They said they dumped his body in Tallahatchie. In fact, they dumped it into the, the bayou. And um, again, did not ever expect the body would float out into the Tallahatchie and would rise up. Um, and uh, this is uh, the scene uh, in the Tallahatchie where his body did rise. And uh, the, it's, it's been cleared out, but it, it is a very, it feels kind of like a sacred space. Uh, there's something very uh, spiritual about even the shaping of the trees around the water at that point. So the last thing that was really interesting uh, for me was the artifact research. Uh, and this was my coup de grace as, as a researcher and as a writer. Uh, Wheeler Parker and his cousin gave me a letter, a copy of a letter that Emma had written to a girl named Eloise Woods. Uh, and I was subsequently able to interview her. But this is Emma's actual handwriting. This is his actual letter. And you, know, you don't really get a chance to get primary information like that. So first, you get the visual sense of, of how neat he was. He wrote this when he was only 13. And those of you, I know you like you guys type, so you don't write this anymore. But do you know how many times this guy must have written this so that there are no mistakes with a with an ink pen, not even a ballpoint pen? So that tells you something about his directness and his desire to impress this girl. And um, there's also uh, within the body of the letter, he tells her, uh, "I'm not going to be able to come uh, out to." Uh, see you next week because my mother wants me to go to Detroit. But uh, I'm going to be back for Carnival uh, Labor Day, and I'm putting two tickets in the envelope. So he was banking for his date three months later. So that tells me something about his directness and also about his interest in girls, and which is again different from the narrative. And. What was really exciting was when I got a chance to talk with Eloise Woods, and uh, I discovered that she was a beautiful brown-skinned woman. So here was a real-life difference from the portrait that was made of him, that he was fascinated with white girls, that he had a white girlfriend, when his object of choice was a beautiful brown-skinned girl. And uh, so all of this was uh, kind of revelatory to me. And then the green feather is something I just found that, that was kind of affirming that I was on the right path. I wrote the beginning of the piece, you know, uh, brim upturned, blonde Panama straw, with a green exotic feather, still say call, new shoes, never been worn, white butt, not a scuff on. And uh, I just written that passage. And then I walked outside of my house in Chicago, and what did I find but a green parrot feather. So I took that as a signal that I was on the right path. Um, and um, just really quickly where I'm going with it next, uh, continuing the journey, I'm going to do a second play on the trial itself. It's a kind of a national chess game between the white queen and the black queen and the pawns and the bishops and the, uh, uh, to do that. At, and I'm going to have an opportunity to actually do a premiere reading in the original courthouse where uh, the trial was held in Summer, Mississippi in 2017. And um, uh, I'm also going to explore the fall of the House of Milan, the fall of the killers, because though they were not convicted, uh, there was a divine justice that made their lives uh, atone for what they had done. But it was not without cost, because there was another couple that was murdered directly after Emmett's death. It was a story that's not in the news, because they were Southern, and all the cameras had gone. But the last play will be uh, the uh, divine punishment, if you will, of the killers, but how the story of the struggle for human rights uh, and human dignity
still was going on and still continues to go on. So I'm going to represent it with, this is uh, Clinton and Mueller Nelson. And uh, that's what I'm working on now. And I got time to share a little bit. I can share a little bit of the piece with you? Yeah. Okay. So let's see if I can find the music part. Um, I'm a playwright, not a performance artist, so I do a poor rendition of my own work, but, but we're going to give it a go. Uh, let's see. So how do I get back to the menu? The sure.
Can you tell us how you came to identify the body?
an image came to me in a fictional piece I was working on called Detroit. And this creature, who was part bird, part man, was telling my character to bear witness. And I said, bear witness to what? And um, so it came to me that this character had been uh, a witness in the Till case and had not come forward. So I first thought I was just doing background research for my own piece. But then uh, it took about five years for me to then realize that I wasn't writing about that character, but that I needed to focus on MS. And I was helped by a colleague from San Francisco because I sent her to see the play that I was writing. And she sent me back the notes with red pencil. This play is not interesting I'm page, until page 30. The big red pencil. And I threw it in a drawer, and I didn't speak to her for six months. And then I took it out, and I realized that she was absolutely right. And that became the start of the play, and also the start of my journey. That was around 1995. So taking that long, off and on, off and on. And it's gone through a lot of permutations. The production in Chicago was a big social drama. I thought I was writing The Crucible or, you know, Inherit the Wind, and I had all these you know, 14 actors, and it was a great production, but it was not doable by so many theaters, in particular this one in Los Angeles. Um, and it was only 99 seats, and they got more, got more people on stage than we can fit in the audience. In. So I shrank it down, I distilled it to a five-actor piece that has been the one that has been circulating. And that was in 2010. Yes. What happened to the writers after the trial? Ah, well, uh, well, that's what I'm going to try to do in this next play. They were actually uh, they were, they remained in uh, the trial was five days in September, uh, and they were found not guilty, and uh, they remained in jail until almost the end of October because there were still outstanding kidnapping charges, uh, but then. Uh, the prosecutor decided not to pursue the kidnapping charges, and so they were released in November. Um, and uh, then an odd thing happened that they were really kind of ostracized. This was an odd family, and when we get stories of the South, it's, it's, uh, we, we have stereotypes of, of, of what that means, you know, sacred David South. Um, even though you know, they killed Emmett because of this transgression. They were really um, uh, over an overseer class. They lived on the black side of town. They were the only white family on the black side of town. And so, uh, you know, their handymen, you know, the people they hung out with were black people, but it was from this position of authority. So after the trial, the black communities began to boycott their string of stores. And then the white community was so embarrassed by the outing of, of the practice of Southern terrorism that they ostracized them too. So Milo went a little crazy. And uh, because he couldn't get money uh, when this opportunity to do his confession came up, uh, he was paid $3,500 for it. Um, Roy got nothing, which I found out later. Um, and uh, then he was even further ostracized because they said, don't fight it, we just got you a not guilty verdict, and you go and confess to a national magazine? What kind of moron are you? You know. And uh, so he was, they were really just ostracized by, by all members of the community. And eventually, most of the family had to relocate to Texas only trickling back to Mississippi years later. Um, Roy Bryant went blind, uh, was nearly convicted of welfare fraud, that is the other brother. Um, both of the wives divorced them. Um, there's a wonderful 60 minute episode on Caroline Bryant, the last living person. And this woman who uh, was supposed to be a beauty queen and got all this notoriety, all this attention, you know, for being this, you know, white damsel person. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, Dark-haired Marilyn Monroe. 
uh, in the 60 minute thing scurries into her house. She looks like she scurries into her house like a little spider, you know, looking over her shoulder. Um, so uh, none of them enjoyed life. Yes. Civil rights stuff will kill you. 
And in fact, it did kill a lot of people. Uh, because the reaction to it, the reaction to this nonviolent effort was violent. So, um, yes? Um, well, so, since there are unfortunate, but we have recent examples of things like this happening, I have to say that when you did do your rendition of your play, like just a piece for Emmett, um, it gave a voice to mother that I've never heard before. Mm -hmm. Because because it's so recent, and it's story after story, they kind of like drop the mother. You don't really hear about the mother unless you want to follow up on it. But I feel like um, just the portion that you read gave light to the portion of the mother and how she feels about it, and just seeing her son in that moment where, oh my goodness, you know, the, that, that similarity, that those are, those are my knees, those are my ears, like, mm -hmm. I recognize that as my child. I thought that, like, that was really, really Oh, cool. thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, as an artist, where do you believe, um, or, like, how, like, how do you balance, like, the truth of the story with also, like, making it entertaining? Ah, well, you know, there's the rub, you know, you just got to try it, you know. What was very helpful for me uh, was you know, the wonderful information that I got from the interviews, but uh, a couple of key things. Um, all of Emma's friends, family, everybody's like, oh, he had such a tremendous sense of humor. He loved to tell jokes. I mean, everybody said this, classmates, Sunday school mates, cousins, whatever. Nobody remembered one joke. So I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> so what am I going to do now? So I had to use the information that I got about him to make the humor, you know. So you know, Emmett went into the fields one day, one half a day, you know. So I tried to use, uh, I tried to use. Uh, oh, there's a part of the car where um, uh, he's riding in the car just because he loved to talk. He was a stutterer. So th that's already gonna, it's, it's chock full of the potential for humor. Because here you have somebody who stutters nonstop, but who can't stop talking. And it has to be the center of attention. So there's one point where, you know, you know he says, ah, oh, bless you, I'll go, what more could you ask for? And Uncle Lowe said, any possibility you can be quiet for one minute? You know, he said, you know, my teacher asked me the same question. And that, that let me go into an anecdote about school where you know, his teacher put him on trial for talking too much. You know? so, <laughs> so he helped a lot by, you know, I tried to create his love of life through this happiness, the pursuit of happiness through his own constant desire uh, to be funny. Uh, and uh, so that really, again, once it gets into the tragic part, you know, such a big drop in, in both the tone of the play and uh, and even then, when he's being tortured, he he is making jokes as part of. Uh, and I, I borrowed that from like Richard Pryor. Uh, I don't know if those of you know Richard Pryor because he's he's you know he passed on, but he was like a major activist and brilliant comedian. And uh, he had a, in Rockauteur, he had a monologue about when he was in jail. And he was looking at, you know, all these dudes coming and said, well, you know, time to be funny, you know. Because, <laughs> you know, this is what he had to parlay while he's there. So I used that same energy and had Emmett even, you know, kind of taunting his, his assailants as a way of, you know, pushing them off. So uh, I think it worked, too. And then, you know, as the young woman said behind you, I, the pathos of the story is so strong. Uh, because that's, those are her actual words uh, in two different circles. One is in the trial, and the other was through newspaper accounts. And so I just made one her interior voice, and it, it, it just gives you the sense of the, the, the tremendous humanity and courage and life force of this family, of this mother and son. Any last question? Yeah, I see one right there. Kind of, or maybe not. Maybe is it just the... Is that you? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, 
students give us some sense of your vision of both optimism and pessimism. I'm sure you're ambivalent of what will transpire, but an example of something that you can latch on to make you feel I'm optimistic about the racial divide in the future and something that worries you as an ongoing issue. Well, that is, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. I, I think the, uh, one of the challenges of, of coming out of the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement uh, was this sense of, one, the sense that you know, we were the first ones doing this and that we succeeded in so many ways. And uh, as a more mature person and scholar, I realized that we weren't the first ones doing this. You know, the resistance and the struggle for liberation has been going on since captivity has been going on. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a chain, it's a wave. Uh, a series, and, and each generation will get its way uh, because uh, the struggle against power uh, is, uh, and, and to equalize power is ongoing. And as dire as uh, these past few months have felt, uh, they are part of the DNA of our nation. And we do have an opportunity at every juncture to change that narrative. And I try with works like this and this new piece I'm working on on the Underground Railroad, which was itself a revolutionary nonviolent resistance movement, uh, uh, to uh, find those threads that speak of racial awakening, racial cooperation, and to put that mythology in our consciousness in the same way that the antebellum narrative of Miss Scarlet and Rep is in our narrative, to replace that with who for me are the real heroes uh, of American democracy, people who are struggling for that revolutionary promise 